Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, and uh, we're recording another uh, Zoom or uh, whatever platform we use, StreamYard <laughs> edition here. We got my uh, co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein, in the house. Hey, now. And Benito, the man behind the glasses with us. I uh, just want to remind you before we get started, please subscribe to our video channel on YouTube. Please subscribe to our podcast uh, on iTunes and, and Spotify and wherever, Google. And then also please uh, support us and follow us on social media. That's a big help. So we have a superstar guest today, and we're pretty excited about that. We have Dave Wedge. Um, a New York Times bestselling author and reporter, and uh, he has a book that came out not long ago. And and you know I've been trying to to book him for the show for some time and talk about this interesting book. Thing with evil, taking down the notorious pagan motorcycle gang. Uh, there you go. So welcome, Dave. How are you guys? Nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, doing well. Thank you for. Uh, spending some time with us sure happy to do it um so let's let's talk about uh your book here how did you what's the genesis of this how did you first get involved in that sure so you know i was a reporter in boston for uh you know 25 years i was at the boston herald for 14 years and um you know i'd covered a lot of a lot of different you know organized crime stuff and news and that sort of thing and I did a book in uh, 2018, 19, it came out in 20, about the Whitey Bulger case. And, um, you know, it was a case that I'd covered extensively over the years. And uh, after Whitey was murdered in prison, I uh, teamed up with another author uh, that I had written some other books with, a guy named Casey Sherman, great writer as well. And um, we did a book called Hunting Whitey. And um, that was basically about, you know, Whitey Bulge's life on the run, how he was caught by the FBI, uh, his trial, what his life was like in prison, then how he got murdered. So after I was done with that one, you know, I was kind of thinking about what to do next. And, you know, as an author, you do a book like that, you know, it, it was a pretty big book and, you know, your phone starts ringing. And um, I got a call from an old ATF friend of mine. It was actually a guy that I played hockey with. I, I played men's league hockey and pick up hockey down here in Boston. And um guy called and he's like, hey, do you remember this guy, Ken Croak? He played with us. And I was like, ah, not really. And he described him to me. And he's like, you know, he's about 6'3", you know, bald goatee. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He was the guy you stayed away from on the ice. Um, so he said, you know, Ken, Ken's just retired from the ETF and he's got a great story that he's never told. He wants to talk to you about it. So as a reporter and an author, you know, you get that sort of call a lot. And, you know, it's always that that meeting you don't take or that call that you don't call back that you miss a great story. So I was like, all right, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll, I'll come meet with him. So I, I went and I met with him at a Dunkin' Donuts down here. And I know I'm laying on the Boston pretty thick here with, you know, Dunkin' Donuts and everything. But uh, um, so I, you know, I, I went and I met Ken and uh, grabbed a coffee. We sat down. He started telling me his story of infiltrating the pagans. And um, within, you know, five, 10 minutes, my my jaw was on the floor. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I was like, uh, I think we have a book here. And he was like, you think? And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And um, I talked to my agent and we started working together and we, we banged it out in about a year, a little more than a year. Let's, let's just contextualize for the audience. Uh, the chapter in New York that Ken infiltrated is right now in 2023, it is the nerve center for the Pagans Nation. And it's the a chapter that has spawned uh, Conan the Barbarian Richter, the yep. most notorious biker boss in America right now. Mm -hmm. And this uh, infiltration by, by uh, Ken infiltrated the leadership in the group that preceded Conan. A uh, guy mm -hmm. named Roadblock Blair uh, was was one of the big shot callers that I know plays a role in your narrative. But this was the Long Island Pagans, and Ken got in there for what two two years? They called him yeah. they called him Smash. They gave him his own yeah, nickname, Slam. 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 Sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he the case started up here in Boston because Ken was a, an ATF agent out of Boston. And before that, he had been in L.A. for many years. 
and he did some biker work out there. He actually worked on that famous Mongols case that you guys are probably aware of where there was an infiltration of the Mongols. And, um, you know, so Ken, Ken was like the one guy in the agent in the agency in Boston that had biker experience. So a tip came in that the pagans were trying to start a chapter here in Boston. And, um, they were like, Hey, Ken, why don't you meet with the guys? So, he went and met with them, went to like a, you know, an informal gathering, like a party at someone's house. And they took a liking to him. And as I described, he's a big giant dude, t- you know, six, four, massive goatee beard, he, you know, looks the part. And uh, the case kind of um, started from there and it shifted from Boston down to Long Island when uh, they asked him to be a, a prospect. And when they asked him to be a prospect, they said, we, we want you to be a prospect, but you got to come and do it down in New York. And the reason they wanted him in New York was because they were in the middle of a, a really hellacious kind of tense feud with the Hells Angels down there um, that, that I describe in the book. And you guys have probably seen the footage of over the years with Roadblock got, uh, got, got beat up pretty bad by some Hells Angels outside the clubhouse there in, in Rocky Point. And there was some other stuff that led up to that. So they needed muscle. And that's why they brought Ken down. And that's where it all started for him. And I know that um, some of what happened in the late 2000s in in Ken's undercover operation, am I stating it correctly? The timeline 08 to 10? Yeah, that's right. Yep. So if you go go backwards to 2002, uh, you had, and I'm interested in in getting uh, your perspective and what Ken shared with you. Uh, you had an incident that was uh, very, very famous and has there's a lot of mythology around this incident now, 20 years later. It's called the Hellraiser's Ball. Ball. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's when uh, pagans and Hell's Angels fought it out uh, at a banquet hall mm-hmm. with bats, knives, guns. Uh, I don't remember. Was it a it was it was a Hell's Angels event that the pagans raided. Yeah, it was, it was a it was a tattoo convention, and it was a, it was a Hell's Angels sponsored event, and uh, the 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 pagans crashed it and uh, literally crashed it, and uh, it's one of the most uh, famous biker kind of public wars that's ever happened. Where, as you said, you know there was guns, knives, bats. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, there was um, a, a pagan that was killed there. Yeah. Um, and I believe um, his name is escaping me. I believe the pagan that was killed there was Mailman. Mailman, was that's right. Robert <laughs> Rutherford, who, <laughs> if we if we want to draw the the line all the way, you know, uh, a through line here, Conan the Barbarian, who got busted two years ago uh, with a uh, illegal possession of a gun, he was leaving a party in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and driving back. To New York City. The party that he was at in Lancaster, Pennsylvania was a annual event that all the pagans go to to celebrate the life of mailman Rutherford. That's who right. Passed, who passed away in, in the O2 Hellraisers ball. That's party. right. And Ken Ken attended that party a couple of times. And that's actually one of the places where he was able to infiltrate uh, the mother club. Um, which, you know, for your listeners that know, no, but the ones that don't, uh, the mother club is kind of the, the, uh, like the, the, the board of directors that oversees all the chapters. And, um, it, it had never been infiltrated before by law enforcement and, uh, Ken, uh, you know, I'm jumping ahead here, but he became a made member, a patched in member of the Long Island chapter, worked his way up and eventually got put on to, um, he was made the sergeant at arms of of the of the Long Island chapter, and then he was made the um, the sergeant at arms of the Mother Club, where he was mm-hmm. out there, um, really kind of watching those guys. And he actually, at, towards the end of the story, I don't want to ruin the whole story for everybody, but he actually was put on the Hit Squad, which was a very elite, secretive Hit Squad that a lot of the pagans didn't even know existed. And uh, again, I don't want to give away the whole story, but that's kind of when the whole case starts to unravel. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that that incident, the Hellraiser's Ball, was really a pivotal moment in the relationship between the Hell's Angels and the Pagans, where you know there was bad, there was always bad blood, but it really escalated 
uh, with that incident. And, and there was many, many other, uh, you know, murders and attacks and things like that. And the whole case that Ken was involved in was all about retaliation against the Hells Angels. And they, the, the pagans there in Long Island and some of the New Jersey chapters were plotting to bomb uh, the Hells Angels. And that, that was the, the center of the case that Ken worked on. So can uh, Dave or Scott, can you contextualize like the, the history of that area? Like New York is all is traditionally considered Hell's Angels territory. So uh, can you trace like the origins of this, this conflict? Yes. Well, you know, the Hell's Angels are obviously the older of the two gangs and they're the bigger of the two gangs, but my research and, you know, my experiences with Ken and all the people I interviewed for the book was that the pagans seem to be, uh, a bit more of an a true outlaw gang than the Hell's Angels. You know, the Hell's Angels seem to have um, a faction that is like mainstream people. You know, bikers, but they're not necessarily outlaws. They just love the biking culture. They love being a part of it and all that sort of stuff. The pagans, um, pretty much every guy that I looked into uh, was a convicted felon. Um, some were murderers. Uh, they, they, there was a lot of drug dealing, racketeering, that sort of stuff. And you know, there's a uh, I believe probably about 12 to 1500 pagans around the U S right now. Um, and, uh, they started in Maryland, uh, Maryland. And like all biker gangs, they started out as, uh, you know, folks coming back from the world war, you know, world war two and Vietnam and Korea. And they just got into the biking culture and they, you know, they were outlaws and, and, uh, you know, the pagans built from there. They, they're, they're very, uh, uh, big in Pennsylvania, Ohio, up and down the Atlantic seaboard, um, New Jersey is very big, and they they have a, a big presence in New York, and even uh, there's there's pagans in New York City, and now they are in Boston. They're down in Florida, and they actually do have some uh, West Coast presence now as well. Just to, to further contextualize and and give you a kind of a thirty thousand foot view of what was going on in the pagans. Uh, organization at this time in the 2000s this was at 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 the point where the seat of power in the organization had moved from philadelphia uh to new york i know that um for a time period uh there was a, a a national president that was in pittsburgh but the new york group gain considerable juice uh in the 2000s and, and and relevancy uh that was kind of in the wake of philadelphia which had always been ground zero for pagans or ha- i shouldn't say always had been ground zero for pagans for the previous 20 25 years by the time you hit the the o2 hellraisers a uh, ball incident is when the pagans in new york s- in, in New York, uh, the, this was the Long Island chapter, uh, were feeling more emboldened and more empowered and, and wanting to uh, assert their 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 will and their, their in their dominance. And guys like Roblox Blair um, and then eventually Conan the Barbarian. Now, Conan Richter, before he went to prison in, I think it was 98 or 99, he had been the national sergeant at arms. Um, he went to prison. Uh, it was a bust in 98 uh, long Island pagans that were trying to extort a strip club called the carousel club, uh, a guy named, I think Sean McCarthy was his name. And they had this guy. Th- th- there's a, there's a movie just about this guy. He was like running this strip club and Conan is sending guys there to extort him. And every time he sends pagans to extort McCarthy, McCarthy beats them up. Uh, there was a f- incident where he like beat up like six or seven pagans. They came back and they stabbed McCarthy. McCarthy still wouldn't give up any tribute. So Conan said, let's kill him. They uh, fortunately for Mr. McCarthy uh, stopped the, the murder plot before it happened. And then Conan goes to prison, but roadblock Blair, who might not get as much uh, national, uh, you know, fanfare was just as formidable of a leader. Uh, than than Conan and was kind of in some ways planted some of the seeds for what Conan is is doing now. That's my take on it. Dave, do you have any opinion? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, Roadblock was actually uh, 
no, not the president of that chapter in Long Island. It was it was a guy named Jr. Jr. Eb- Jr. Ebling. Yeah, Jr. Ebling and, and yeah. Jr. But Roadblock and him kind of ran the chapter together. Um, there was a great mutual respect there. And Road Roadblock had a brother named Hogman, um, who was it was kind of his his half brother. And Hogman was like a disgusting, uh, filthy being, and uh, he was actually a prospect with uh, with Ken. They were prospects together. And I think, you know, part of the drama that happens in our story is that as Ken is rising up, Hogman is a little, I don't want to say jealous of him, but he's a little, you know, it's a competition. And I think Hogman was a little angry that that Roadblock, his brother, didn't advance him faster than he advanced Ken. So there was some tension there within the club with, uh, you know, with, with Hogman and Ken. And, you know, we lay out a lot of different uh, scenes and stories throughout throughout the book where, you know, Ken, the thing that I found fascinating with Ken is, you know, he was really able to put himself into that criminal world um, in, in a really, you know, obviously an authentic way, but a very strategic way where he was able to think his way out of different scenarios that other people would have ended up being made or arrested or killed, uh, or at least, you know, brutally assaulted. Um, you know, Ken likes to say when he does these sort of interviews and he does a lot of talks around the country about the work he did, that that he had a good deal of luck on his side. But knowing him, that is true. But he also made his own luck by uh, making the right move at the right time to not put his his life and his, and his mission into jeopardy. And a lot of it was with people like Roadblock, and um, you know, there's another guy uh, from from the gang, uh, Hellboy. You guys may remember him. And yeah, he just re- he just got in trouble a couple years ago. Yeah, he's been, he was the one down in New York. I think he cracked the guy's head open with a bat. Or something. Yeah, a Hell's a Hell's Angel. A Hell's Angel, right? Um, and uh, you know, Hellboy was a guy that um, was you know strung out on crystal meth. He was constantly, uh, you know selling drugs and selling weapons and buying weapons. And you know, there's a great scene in the book with Ken and, and Hellboy that they have an explosive in a, in, a, in a restaurant and Ken has to figure out what to do with that explosive. And that's one of these examples of how just, you know, shit luck, but also his uh, strategic mind got him out of this situation where he was able to not only get Hellboy away, he was able to get the explos- explosive away from Hellboy got it to a safe place without getting made and then was able to get the bomb squad to come in and take custody of that explosive without anyone getting hurt. And, you know, and I don't want to, again, don't give it all away, but when you read how he did it, it's pretty fascinating. And, and Ken was so good at what he did that uh, at the end of the case, when, when the jig is up and they end up, you know, all the arrest warrants go out and they, they bust all these guys, they do all the raids. Ken's back in the police station in, in Long Island and he's got his badge around his neck, you know, his, his lanyard or whatever. And Hellboy's in there being questioned. And even when Ken was in there dressed as in his cop clothes, Hellboy still refused to believe that Ken was a cop. And let me ask, like, I know you don't want to give too much away, but how does he like start off? If you can describe a little bit, at least, how does he endear himself to that? I always find that interesting, whether it's guys who infiltrate Cosa Nostra families or or bikers. I mean, how? How do you endear yourself in that atmosphere and yeah, in that Dave, culture? Can you give Dave us tell, some of that? Dave, tell him the story of how he got the nickname. I think that's one of the ways he endeared himself. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a good point. So, you know, initially it's just a matter of, you know, street smarts and and playing the role. And as I said, Ken had had done a lot of biker cases out on the West Coast, so he knew the culture. He already had a backstory that if they looked into it, they would find that was true that he had a criminal record under his alias, which was Ken Palace. And when he first started uh, going down to Long Island and he was prospecting, you know, th- those guys, they hang out in bars, they do that sort of stuff. They go to parties and, and all this. And, and there was a, an incident at a bar down in Rocky Point where it was a pagan bar and some guy uh, put his hands on JR. And, and anybody that knows biker culture knows you touch president and there's a problem so they told ken they said take this guy outside we're going to tune him up so they're they're uh you know they're they're heading outside and this guy's like oh you know he knows he's going to get a beating 
and uh, as they're as they're going outside, Ken picks them up off the port. They're they're on like a deck, like a wooden deck, and they're walking out the back of the bar. And Ken picks the guy up and s- slams him, and the guy bounces off the ground. Goes, Ooh, like big loud, and and it was a really loud body slam. And Ken did that not only to show these guys what he was doing, but he knew doing that wasn't going to kill the guy. And, and as opposed to hitting him with a pool cue, punching him, kicking him, you know, doing something like that, like a body slam, he knows he shows those guys, he means business, but he's not really going so far that he's going to really put this person in the hospital. Um, the guy ended up getting tuned up pretty good by, by a bunch of the guys and, and Ken um, did what he had to do to get out of there and get that guy out of there. Basically he let them, you know, tune them up a little bit. And then Ken kind of, uh, you know, participated in the beating, uh, however you want to say it. And he got him away and it was Karen said, get out of here before you killed. And after that, they were like, oh, dude, you slammed that guy. And then they started calling him Slam. And that became his club nickname. That's great. They, yeah, I mean, pretty wild. all the clubs have great nicknames, but the guys that were uh, bandying about here, uh, you know, Hogman, whose real name I think is Kenny Van Diver. Uh, Hellboy, whose real name is, I think, Robert Durandi, <laughs> but it sounds better to call them Hellboy and Hogman, yeah. uh, Conan, uh, Keith Richter and, and Roblox. Just uh, it's like something that you'd find in a um, a screenwriter's room in Hollywood uh, making these guys up. But these are real, you know, uh, flesh and flesh and bone. I mean, the, these these guys uh, aren't coming off of a, a screenwriter's script. The, these guys live it. And I've always said that and I'm interested in to get Dave's perspective on this, you know, as you know, in my crime writing experience, until I encountered outlaw biker culture, I I mean, I had no idea. Uh, I had done a lot of reporting and interacting with Italian uh, organized crime, African-American organized crime, Jewish and Irish organized crime. But about uh, 10, 12 years ago, I got exposed to the outlaw biker culture in, in Detroit. And it was like, as much as I had seen, this was the way I had described it is this is the fringe of the fringe. Uh, and it just was like, it was a, it was so different than all the other organized crime that I had covered. A lot of uh, parallels not different in some of the fundamentals, but different in the day to day. Can you kind of speak to your exposure to that and, you know, how it compared to your previous uh, reporting? Yeah, the same, you know, I, I had a lot of experience covering, you know, obviously up here in Boston, the Irish mob, the Italian mob, I had done a lot of, you know, street gang stuff with the, you know, the inner city gangs, uh, triad gangs and, in, in uh, you know, Chinatown, Russian organized crime. Um, but you know, nothing quite prepares you for uh biker culture. And cause there's another layer to it that, that, you know, you, you maybe don't see with some of those other organized crime factions, which is the outlaw, uh, lifestyle, you know, and the nomadic lifestyle and it's by design. And as I said, you know, a lot of these, these pagans are, are, you know, very nomadic. They operate outside of the normal government structures, you know, and, um, there were some that had, you know, fronts for like a normal life, like, you know, roadblock, I believe it was, was like a volunteer fireman, you know, in the town. But the real reason he did that was, you know, I guess to, to have a civic purpose in some fashion, but really it was to give himself the image of legitimacy so that he could glean information about what the town's doing, you know, what the government's doing, what the police are doing, you know, and so that he has people he can go to if there's a question about something the gang's doing, he can get some intelligence on, you know, where their vulnerabilities might be. Um, so that that was always fascinating to me was that. The other thing that I, I learned a lot about during the research and the writing of this book was, you know, just the old school tactics employed by, by the bikers and, and by the pagans in particular, one of which being the old school shakedown. You know, they, they just, they shook down bar owners. They literally went, uh, and Ken was with them when they did it. They went bar to bar on the uh, boardwalk down in Wildwood, New Jersey, or it might've been Elizabeth. I, I can't remember which town it was, but 
they, they literally would go walk into each establishment and some of them were ready for it and they just hand them an envelope. Some of them, they just go to the bartender and say, pay up. And they, you know, they all did. And, and, you know, and this wasn't in 1978 or 1948, this was in 2008, you know, and 2009, 2010. So it's not that long ago. It's, it's a racket that they still are engaged in. And it, it's frankly a racket that works. It's, it, these are cash businesses and they know, you know, there's, there doesn't even have to be a threat of violence. They don't even have to say, hey, give me the money or I'm going to kill you. They just, their very presence there with their colors lets those people know if they don't pay, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to get hurt or their business is going to be ruined by a bunch of bikers hanging out there causing trouble. So it's fascinating. It's a fascinating culture. And then that money is, you know, a percentage of that is kicked up to the mother club. And that was a big part of the, the RICO case that, that Ken was able to build was he drew that direct line from the street money to the mother club and he showed that it was a uh, corrupt organization. Yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to that because when I've, I've done field research and I, not, I don't think I've interviewed as many people as Scott has, but doing field research, talking to people who are part of that culture, a pushback that I hear from them is they say, well, they may acknowledge that certain individual members may be involved in organized criminal activities, but that's on them. And that's not um, the club's decision or that the club orchestrates something like that. And that it's, it's um, it's unfair to, for law enforcement to target an entire club for some kind of conspiracy when, you know, they're not responsible for the behaviors of, of their individual members. Um, obviously uncle Sam doesn't believe that, uh, but I'm intrigued by that as a criminologist. Uh, can you, can you speak to that debate? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that, that is true in a lot of organizations where, you know, the, like I said, the hell's angels, you know, you have a chapter, you may have some guys that live at home with their family and they're, they, they're dentists. So they have a, you know, a job, they run a construction business and, you know, they may operate within the government framework and they just like to be, you know, they like to be a hell's angel and travel and, and get that notoriety that comes with it. But they aren't violent and they aren't criminals. That happens. Uh, unfortunately for the pagans, Ken was able to get on record, uh, record the only time that anyone had ever captured the recording of a church session. And church for the pagans is basically their planning meetings, their, their weekly church where all the members go. And they outline all the club business. And unfortunately for them, the ones that were caught on tape, there was a lot of talk of uh, violent crimes, um, you know, extortion, shakedowns, uh, and, and plotting attacks on the Hell's Angels. And these were coordinated conspiracies that happened, and they were they were coordinated by the leadership of the club. And by having those on tape. Um, it was irrefutable evidence that the organization was was corrupt and that they, their uh, their their purpose was crime. Dave, did Ken have any um, crossover interactions when he was with or when he was undercover with the pagans, where they were dealing with a traditional Italian organized crime? That's a good question. You know, there was the my my memory is not what it used to be, guys. So I apologize. Um, but uh, th there was some situations where there was talk of uh, the pagans doing some body work for the uh, the La Cosa Nostra. Um, I don't believe it ever materialized in this case. But you know, from my research and from my interviews with with people and from my many conversations with Ken. It's pretty common that that you know the mafia will farm out um, contract work f to 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 bikers, right. just as it's very common for the bikers to farm out uh, work to street gangs, you know, uh, Crips, Bloods, whoever they need to deal with, buying guns, selling guns, buying drugs, selling uh, selling drugs, and you know, the mafia has plenty of their own murderers and killers, but if they can get it a step away from them with another organization like the pagans that that's that's a tool in their toolbox yeah I've never, dave, sorry to interrupt scott no, I think, go I think in, in dave's book i think you specifically mentioned the colombos 
at, at one point was okay. yeah. because yeah. I'm I'm, in, I'm interested in that. I I know that when it comes to the Philadelphia Pagans, they've had a long time relationship, uh, most of it positive with the Bruno Scarfo crime family. I mean, dating back to the to the seventies, um, there was a period of time I think in the eighties where they were at odds, but for the most part in their relationship, it's been very symbiotic and I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We, we both benefit from it with the power moving up or with the power moving to New York. I have heard the the rumors and, and the stories and the allegations, but unlike in Pennsylvania where you can actually see government documentation of this guy meeting with this guy, these guys doing stuff together. I haven't been able to find that in New York. I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but I've, I've always been interested in that Long Island chapter. I just, it, you just, I don't know how they couldn't be doing some dovetailing with the wise guys that are out in Long Island. There's so many of them that are, you know, from the Queens, the Bronx, Brooklyn, that move out to Long Island to, you know, raise their families or whatever. So I was just I was interested to see if if Ken uh, had any first first hand experience with that. Yeah, well, well um, you know, he, he jogged my memory a little bit. My, if my memory serves me correct, again, I uh, I believe Roadblock had kind of bragged to Ken a little bit or, or talked to him at times about having a guy in the Gambino family that he dealt with on a regular basis, and that there would be some work coming their way. Uh, and as a as a cop. You know, investigating that group, Ken uh, pursued that, um, but it never, like I said, it never materialized the way they needed it to to become part of the case. But I agree with you. I mean, I think you know these worlds are are um, are pretty small, and in, in these you know these these universes uh, collide with each other regularly. And you know, if you're a, a, a violent street gang or a violent biker gang in Long Island, it's not going to be long before you get a visit from someone who will tell you that it's their territory, you know, and, and, you know, there's, there's always someone to pay tribute to. So, uh, but we didn't get into a lot of that, but I, you know, there was enough there that, that I, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that there's a pretty um, regular ongoing relationship at some, some level there. Just going to, to your hometown, you know, in Boston, me and Jimmy heard reports at some point in the last 10 years, Jerry Andulo passed away longtime underboss of the uh, patriarchal crime family based out of the North end. And, you know, we heard that there was a whole contingent of hell's angels that came to pay the, their final respects to, to Jerry and Jerry hadn't been on this had, I mean, he was out of prison for a couple of years before he died living very quietly as his health deteriorated, but he hadn't really been on the street as a major player since like 1983 or 84. So the fact that you would have a group of hell's angels in the 2010s, uh, come to his funeral and in a public showing of support, I think, I think there's something to be, (laughs) some nuggets to, to be taken away from that in terms of being able to glean what that relationship means and how it still exists today between these, you know, these two groups. Well, I would say, you know, part of that is respect. You know, Jerry Angulo is, you know, to the name of your podcast, he was an OG, you know, and he had the street cred. He had the street respect. You know, he ran the mob in Boston. Um, He also served prison time. So, you you, you know, white guy in prison, white Italian, wouldn't be unusual for him to have some layer of uh, protection or relationship or mutually beneficial relationship with uh, Hell's Angels and even you know, Aryan Nation guys and a lot of the Aryan Nation guys in prison are are Hell's Angels. They're pagans, you know, and um, so there's that whole thing. Um, and, you know, just historically here in Boston, the organized crime factions have always um, kind of fed off each other, fueled each other. You know, the whole Whitey Bulger case, look at it. What's that all about? It's all about Whitey ratting out the Italian mafia. But at the same time, you know, Whitey used mafia soldiers uh, to, to his needs at times. You know, yeah. he needed some muscle on a case and he need, and it had to be a mafia guy. Had- Whitey, Whitey wanted to remove the Italian mobsters that he didn't like. Guys like the Angelos, guys like uh, 
Joe Russo and Vinny the Animal, and then replace them with a uh, a guy that was easier to deal with in his mind, Cadillac Frank Salemi, um, who wasn't from that same group, was still an Italian mob guy, but it wasn't that. And tell me if you think I'm wrong. I don't want to uh, undermine what you're saying, but it, it wasn't that Whitey didn't necessarily want Italians around. He just wanted Italians that were loyal to him. Yeah, no, that that's a hundred percent accurate. And uh, I mean, you know, Stevie Fleming was his right hand man. Right. Stevie he was right Italian, man. and he you never know. got. He was an uh, Italian that was the second in charge of the Irish mob. That's right, and, and you know, k- kind of like you know Henry Hill and, and Goodfellas. You know, he was not could never be a made guy. Same thing was with Flemmy. He wasn't pure Italian, but you know, Cadillac Frank Salemi. They they had a lot of dealings over the years, um, and you know, you're right. I mean, Whitey wanted those old school OGs out of the way because they were they were chipping off of you know the top of the money from him, and that he wanted that money and. Um, you know, his whole strategy was to get rid of them so that he could be the kingpin. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, to the broader point here with, with the pagans, you know, the pagans aren't stupid, you know, and but they are street guys. And if I don't care if it's a mafia guy, Russian mafia or, or you know, Crips and Bloods, if they offer the right pagan the right amount of money to take care of some business, they're going to they're going to do it. Yeah, I would just say, um, I, I know, I, again, I know th- this kind of conversation is not a large part of your book, but it, but it is interesting. We're talking about it. Um, what I've heard from street sources, so you could, you could take it for what it is, that in terms of underworld politics, diplomacy, that um, apparently the Hells Angels have traditionally pretty close with some Cosa Nostra groups in like the Bronx and places like that, and that the pagans on Long Island sort of monitor that <laughs> just to make sure like because they're obviously in conflict with the hell's angels and just to your point dave to make sure you don't like um accidentally get ensnared in some other kind of uh problem with another group that you don't necessarily want a problem with so um that's just something that i've heard yeah yeah look at uh, you know in intra gang uh politics is very real and you know these guys take their hierarchy very seriously as you guys are well aware you guys do this for a living you know you're you you guys clearly do your homework you know i'm impressed with with the knowledge of the the irish mob and the, and the italian mob up here that that you guys have and um you know it, it's it's just one of those things where if you get to a certain level in organized crime you're going to have to deal with the politics it's going to happen Yep. And uh, that's what happened with the pagans, and that's what happens with every single organized crime uh, faction that that has ever existed. And at some point, there's someone bigger with a bigger army that's going to want to talk to you. Be- Benny yeah. can hit. Go ahead, sorry, Jimmy. Go ahead. Uh, I was just. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. Make your. I was point say it. Benny can can hit the siren here, but just for Dave's knowledge, uh, I worked with Frank Salemi for a short period of time uh, on his autobiography that never <laughs> saw the light of day. Um, but uh, I enjoyed my time interacting with him and thought it, it would have been a great project if we would have ever been able to do it. But uh, he canceled it kind of out of the blue after we'd been talking for a couple of weeks. Um, maybe it was a month or two. And I didn't really know why. And then like six months later, they dug up Stevie DeSaro's body. So... So it just you, wasn't it wasn't meant it why? wasn't meant to be right so you learned why yeah sorry jimmy go ahead yeah so one thing else i wanted to ask dave about your reporting and your conversations with ken so as you mentioned in some cases even if when when they're outlaw bikers they they have this like fringe lifestyle but but they don't necessarily always live like that a lot of these guys live in the suburbs have families the one guy's a volunteer firefighter they sometimes donate stuff to charity did Ken run into any kind of frustration in the sense of like the, the, that the community in which these guys live in, like they don't necessarily have a problem with the bikers. And and you see parallels with the Italians and the Irish for the, the sort of attitude of like, Hey, look, this guy might be an outlaw biker, but he doesn't bother me. He's a good neighbor. <laughs> you know, he's a volunteer firefighter. He ain't, they ain't beating up me or anyone I know. So um, what's the big problem? Um, is, is that, is that a dynamic that undercover agents have to encounter overcome? Yeah, a, a lot of times, yes. But, you know, I, th- I think the bikers are a, a slightly different because of just the optics. 
you know, uh, mother and her daughter going to dance in school on a Saturday afternoon, see a group of pagans, they're going to be scared. You know, they're, they're going to be worried. Uh, just like, you know, they see a group of, it's, it's a little more intimidating than seeing a couple old Italian guys in the corner, you know? So <laughs> there's an intimidation factor uh, with, with the biker gangs. And, you know, one thing that I learned is, you know, when, when they do the, um, I forget the term they use, you guys will probably know, but they, they do, you know, they do the rides through the towns when they, when they go on these, they go to these big mandatory events, like in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the middle of nowhere, and they saddle up and a thousand pagans go ripping through the town with, you know, all wearing their colors. And it's, it's basically a show of force is what it is. It says, we're here, we're in charge of this town for the weekend, uh, back off. And, you know, the way it was described to me, um, you know, that event in Lancaster and similar ones out in Ohio and, and, and even down in Wildwood, it becomes something where the police really stay away from it as much as they can. You know, unless there's shootings, they, they're not going in there. They're not going there to break up parties or break up crowds. Cause that's a lose lose, you know? Yeah. It, I think something is, is changed a little bit with the perception, at least for some with like Hollywood, like sons of anarchy and things like that, where in some cases, some, some people find it like exciting to see a group of outlaw bikers riding through the town, you know, shake things up a bit. Um, and I, and my understanding again, uh, just from what field research I've done is that there's becoming an issue with like these poser clubs, people people who watch too much sons of anarchy and then think they can start up an outlaw a so-called one percenter club until they run into some actual one percenters <laughs> and well, then that, they probably that, that regret happens. it well that happens in 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 the book you know there's a scene down at wildwood at the road of the shore where one uh there's a you know the rule down there is you know no one flies their colors except for the pagans um and there was a, a guy that went by with like some fake you know, puppet club. Um, and he, you know, he got, he got tuned up. Um, there's another great story to your point with like people being kind of starry eyed with these bikers, um, cause of Hollywood depictions and that sort of thing. Uh, down on the boardwalk, Ken was with a bunch of pagans and he tells a story about, you know, uh, a mom and her little kids coming up and taking pictures with them and stuff. And he actually put, Ken actually pulled the little kid aside and was like, don't ever be like me, you know, and here he is an undercover cop, but he's, talking to the kid as slam, you know? So it's one of those kind of poignant moments in the book that we talk about. And there's a whole family element where, you know, Ken juggled that whole life as a dad, you know, he had three little girls at home at the time and, um, you know, living as a, as, a, as a, oh, there's one, actually one other hilarious scene that I, I have to just mention. Uh, speaking of Sons of Anarchy, he said the guys love to watch it and oh. they would sit and they would watch it basically to make fun of it and, and say what bullshit it was. And so Ken, Ken saying, you know, here I am a fake biker with a bunch of real bikers watching a show about fake bikers. Right. And, and, art and, imitating yeah. life, life Imit imitating art. Exactly. Yeah. But we're, we're winding up, uh, winding down here. We got a couple more minutes. Uh, I want to throw something out at Dave and get his take on, because I think there's been some club, uh, protocol alterations, I would say, in the last 10 years since Ken went undercover. And I know from reading your book, and I agree with this wholeheartedly in, in, in a lot of my research, that there are strands and sometimes more than just strands of, of white nationalism, uh, white supremacy that uh, filter through these, these outlaw biker clubs. What I've been told in my reporting since Keith Richter took over and announced his uh, blue wave expansion campaign to spread the, the Pagan's brand around the country was that he lifted a, a I don't know if it was a ban or a, he basically opened up the door to the Pagan's for non-whites, uh, particularly targeting in his recruiting uh, uh, Latinos and Hispanics and his reputed number. I don't even, I don't even think it's reputed. I think it's acknowledged his number two uh, or the vice president that the national vice president is, is Hugo 
uh, Nieves, who they call Zorro. So is this something that you and Ken have talked about that's like, oh, wow, that's different than it was 15 years ago? And what do you think that signifies? Yeah, we, we talked about that a lot because that was a, a pretty big theme in the book where the guys that Ken dealt with, uh, he dealt with a lot of white supremacists, Nazis, Nazi tattoos, the Iron Cross, the swastika, all that stuff. Um, there was a there's a scene in the book where Ken's at one of the uh, mandatories and and uh, some guy, uh, some pagan uh, forces him to hand out a bunch of um, really disgusting uh, racist literature, you know, comparing blacks to to animals and things like that. And um, so there, it was in Ken said, you know, it was pretty widely accepted that that was the culture when Ken was in. There was no blacks at all, but there was uh, Kano was was a was one of the leaders at the time, and he was a, a Latino guy. Um, so Latinos seemed to have a little bit of um, leeway to get into the club, but there, there were no African Americans. Um, my understanding from you know, I haven't talked to Ken in in a while about this issue, but the last time we talked about it, in, you know, the past year or two, um, that they were kind of. Um, relaxing that kind of restriction a little bit and they were letting more non-whites into the into the gang but you know what what I think it is more than more than them not being racist it's a numbers thing you know they need they need it's more tactical. numbers it's a tactical decision in my you know in my analysis if you're going to expand west <laughs> you, need, you need to have a Latino presence. Yeah, if you're going to be on the West Coast, you need yeah. you need that because the Mongols are, are you know, the, right. and the Vagos. I mean, those guys are heavily Latino, and uh, you know, biker culture in general is a, is a big thing in the Latino culture. Um, and if the pagans want to keep expanding, um, they're going to have to let in some people that um, aren't aren't you know pure blood, as as the Aryans would say. Uh, one of the last questions here um, that we'll we'll find out what what you're working on next and how people can can look up find out more about Dave. But um, Scott's done a lot of reporting about the these so-called blue wave mandate, and I know I know that's um, your book predates that a bit. But um, do you have any thoughts on that? Like the, in terms it's of very, this, it's this very idea of the pagans, it's very ambitious, right? What, what, what Richter's trying to do. I mean, it's very bold. Yeah. Yeah, so based on you being in the trenches there, what what are your thoughts on that, Dave? Well, I, I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, part of the reason Ken and them did this case was because they wanted to uh, expose the tactics to give law enforcement around the country a tool to stop the expansion and more more importantly to stop the criminal activity or at least recognize it when it's happening so they can deal with it. Um, and what Ken, you know, Ken wasn't able to stop the pagans. Nothing's going to stop a street gang. But what he was able to do was glean, was glean um, invaluable information uh, for law enforcement, you know, really forever. And Ken's constantly being called by uh, law enforcement agencies around the world and asked for, you know, advice and guidance on how to handle certain situations and for him to try to help them identify what exactly a gang might or might not be doing. Um, and that's information you can only get from being inside the gang, um, which, again, Ken's the only cop to ever get inside the pagans. So that's information that, you know, goes to the grave with Ken and everyone that can use it now, they, they'd be wise to. But um, to the point of expanding, you know, I, I, I understand totally why Conan would want to do that. Um, you know, the Hells Angels are the, are the much bigger gang, much more recognizable gang. But, you know, strength in numbers, you know, and um, we live in a world that's digital now. And to have a, a nomadic um, organization that can be successful, you need more numbers. Because if you stop putting it on the Internet and using cell phones and doing all that stuff, as opposed to hand to hand and face to face, you, you're increasing your risk of, of uh, being being captured or caught. Yeah, good insight, Dave. Appreciate that. So, Jimmy, can, can I just throw one thing out real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I just want to clarify this with Dave, and for our audiences, it, it, it might be interesting to them. Uh, the last forty-eight hours of Ken's undercover work. Am I right to say that that was at the the Roar on the Shore, uh, which was a gathering of pagans in Wildwood, New Jersey? I think in two thousand ten, when the investigation was coming to an end, and Roadblock 
Blair stood up in a hotel suite and gave a speech that I think Ken recorded where he was threatening or telling his men to go kill Hell's Angels. And then I, I just want to make sure I have the timeline correct. And then within like 12 hours, they pulled Ken uh, from his undercover work and they arrested everybody. Is that true? Yeah, I, I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but that's that's a, sounds about right. It was, okay. it was it was certainly that uh, speech that, you know, it was basically like, you know, Roadblock ha- had gotten um, that beating from from the Hells Angels. And it was a rallying cry to 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 launch their offensive, you know, the counter offensive on the Hells Angels. And that was really what precipitated the, uh, you know, the, the end of the case. In addition to there was a hit put out that, that Ken was supposed to be involved in. He was supposed to be carrying out a hit with Hellboy and other members of the hit squad. And that was the moment where, you know, the ATF, finally, all the factions that have been disagreeing about where to go with the case, when to end it and all that stuff, finally said, yeah, it's, it's probably time to get him out. And, you know, Ken was at, at great risk at that point of either getting killed or getting outed which would have resulted in him getting killed. So very dramatic end to his undercover work. It's, it's very cinematic. I just wanted to, I, I was pretty sure that I read that and I think I actually might've wrote it 10 years ago, but I just wanted to clarify it with, with the experts expert. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was uh, absolutely dramatic. And, and the clock was ticking. Uh, you know, one, the last thing I'll mention, one thing we didn't talk about was Ken actually got arrested while he was a pagan. Uh, so he got arrested and kept his cover through his incarceration. It was only a few days, but um, he had to, you know, be a fake pagan in jail and and uh, put up that front so that he didn't blow his cover completely and blow the case. And that was a pivotal moment in the story because that's when the clock started ticking. Once that happened, the case would either have to go to trial or the DA would have to throw it out because they know he's not a real pagan. And so neither one of those things could happen or, or Ken would have been outed. So once he got arrested, the clock started ticking and they had to wrap the case up. Well, I, I encourage our audience members to check out Dave's book with Ken riding with evil, taking down the notorious pagan uh, motorcycle gang. And um, also your, your book on Whitey Bulger too. I think our audience would be interested in. So Dave, uh, as we uh, finish up here, uh, how can people find out more about your books and do you have anything coming up you'd like to share with us? Yeah, no, I, I'm. I've got a couple of projects that I'm. I'm kind of kicking the tires on right now. I haven't really landed yet on what what I'm going to do next for my book, but um, we are working on uh, developing Riding with Evil. We, we hope to have some news soon, but you know the strike isn't too helpful right now. Oh, that would so, be awesome. I yes, I've been. I don't know why there haven't been more I, television shows and movies about cops infiltrating biker clubs because there's been a zillion of them about cops infiltrating mafia groups well from from your lips to god's ears as they yeah. say you know, so we're, we're hoping yeah. to get that done oh yeah, that's a big one we we actually just did we adapted the whitey bulger book for a stage show that we just did in boston um a sold out one night performance with neil mcdonough starred as oh, whitey yeah. bulger. neil from band of brothers and american horror yeah. story and yellowstone yeah um, that was a and we're, we're developing that further we're going to try to bring it into a bigger production take it around the country um so that that's going on those are the big ones but if people want to reach out they can find me on social media uh probably the best is is probably instagram at at david m wedge and uh yeah i i, D- I, Dave, I last i promise last question black mass like it or love it or don't like it at all it, it was good i'm I'm friends with kevin Cullen. he's a, he's a pal of mine and i know shelly murphy and the book's wonderful and you know, I oh, the, book, the book is one of the greatest yeah, organized crime is, books yeah. that's ever yeah. been written. I'm I not agree. talking about the book. I'm talking yeah. about the Johnny Depp movie. Oh, no, I know. Yeah, it was based getting, on the book, um, based on the book. So actually, Neil, Neil McDonald was in the mix for that. But obviously, Johnny Depp's the biggest star. So he, he got the role. But I, I thought Johnny Depp was OK. I didn't love the story, the way they portrayed it. Um, they tried to humanize him, but I don't think it fully worked. I agree. Um, I, I, you know, it was okay. I give it like a B minus, you know, C plus, you know, I like the departed better, frankly, much, oh, yeah. much better. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Sorry. I caught you a little off guard, but I wanted to know what someone from Boston who's actually reported on Whitey Bulger, if they liked that movie or if they saw value in it. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, 
I, I'm always for these movies being made, you know, but uh, I, I didn't love Black Mass. That movie didn't seem to resonate with the public. That's one of the reasons I wanted to ask. Well, you. I think I think Depp looked weird in the role. He just he looked weird. He didn't look scary or he didn't look like Whitey. He just looked like a weird guy in a costume. They said and they, as crazy as they made him to be in that movie, they sanitized him. Like yeah, you just said they, yeah. they took away all of the the sexual craziness with him preying on young boys and girls, and I mean, he was like asexual in the movie. Which Nicholson touched on in The Departed, right? Which they right, which with The Departed had the balls to actually address it, right, right. Which is why I, I part of the reason. I, and I, I digress. I digress. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks, thanks again, Dave. We really this was great. Your time. Loved it. Um, loved it. Yeah. Yes, it thank you guys. Helpful. Great to meet you. Take care. Thanks, Take Dave. Take care, Dave. And thanks everyone for listening to the Original Gangsters podcast. Uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. 